she wanted to come to actual me. meeting, and that's... Good evening. No. Welcome to Athens City Council uh, tonight, Monday, January 28th. Uh, will be a, uh, a night of committee meetings and presentations. Uh, we have a presentation regarding our fair housing program and also a presentation um, about our Athens public transit system. So let us begin with uh, fair housing. And please introduce yourself and go from there, sir. Where is there a specific place you would like for me to to be <laughs> in the room? Somewhere in the room. Near a mic. By a microphone. Do you need by a <laughs> microphone. There's a microphone over yeah. there. There's some on the tables if you want to sit. Uh, that's okay. I'll stand in front of I have a, sign, a, a sign-in sheet that I need, if you guys don't mind signing that, uh, so that we can, it's part of the program. And uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, my name is Donald Eager, and I am a fair housing consultant. I've been doing fair housing work for 35 years, and we just recently started doing the fair housing program for the city of Athens. We have done it in the past. It's been about five years since we uh, have worked in the city. The fair housing program that we do is part of the community development block grant program that you get money for and also if you do chip program uh, or any programs that you get funded through the uh, department of development or uh, it's called something else now i know but i i uh, can't remember it but uh, as a requirement to getting those funds you are required as a city and every time the mayor signs off on the community development block grant application and on your grant agreement to get the money, you are guaranteeing that every citizen uh, in the city of, uh, of Athens will have uh, the right to live where they want to and can afford. And that is a duty that you have uh, and, and that's a requirement uh, of getting those funds. And both the state and HUD takes that funding very seriously uh, Recently, there was a case in uh, New York City, or New York, uh, Westchester County, that gave back $621 million of uh, community development block grant funds because they con consistently took the money but didn't do anything with it and blocked affordable housing, blocked uh, housing for uh, the disabled and so forth. So it is a serious thing that you take. And basically, the way the program works is there are certain requirements that the state has that you must do as part of your for, uh, fair housing program. Uh, there are meetings, there's outreach, there's enforcement. And we do that for the city. And the way that we do it is that we try to work in a way that we protect the city from, uh, from, from issues, housing issues, and so forth that might come up to make sure also that you're always in compliance with the requirements that both HUD and the uh, state of Ohio puts on you to receive the funding so that the next time you apply for funding that you uh, – uh, will not have any problems in terms of fair housing because fair housing is something that they review every time you send in your applications to see what you've done in the past. Uh, each of you have little packets. Uh, those are some of the information that we distribute out through the community. Uh, we have just done a mailing. As a matter of fact, I dropped it in the mailbox on our way down that has uh, that pink uh, poster in there and it also has that same poster in a full color and it has the uh, a supply of the green and the orange uh, brochures uh, we have been setting up meetings with OU with off-campus housing and so forth to work with them so that we can coordinate uh, issues and so forth uh, with them uh, is that's part of the outreach effort. The enforcement effort is we have a 1-800-24-7 uh, hotline that people can call with housing questions. We do not define that they can't, that if they have a, a question about a mortgage, then we won't help them, or if they have a question that's not specifically fair housing related, 
that we would deny them. We work with anybody and everybody if it's a housing issue, uh, even to some cases if it's not a housing issue, uh, we will assist them in any way that we can. Uh, Experience-wise, typically we deal with a lot of tenant landlord calls. That's probably going to be the majority of them um, from past experience in working in Athens. Uh, we uh, work with those and uh, we help people uh, in terms of getting repairs, in terms of uh, uh, evictions, in terms of trying to find money to help with rent to try to find money to help with paying a mortgage. We work with landlords and helping them put together uh, policies that, that help them get good, sound uh, tenants. Uh, we will be having a number of those before the end of our, the program year, which would be the end of August, uh, probably once uh, spring, although it does seem like spring now. But if, once spring comes, we'll be having a number of uh, trainings for landlords will have one for real estate um, professionals who can get three hours of continuing education in both ethics and civil rights for free which is a good thing because that way they don't have to drive to columbus or go somewhere else to get it and so forth so one of the and for you as council members we serve we like to think that we serve as a resource for you if you get calls from constituents within your various wards or within the community that have housing problems. You can either give them our phone number, which is on the brochures and so forth. It's the 1-800 number, 1-800-850-0467, and you can give them that number, or you can call us, and we will uh, uh, see what we can do. Uh, we work with neighborhood groups, community groups, anybody that we can to continue to get the word out and to make sure that uh, if people have questions or have issues that at least they have a place they can go. We can't always solve all of them, uh, but a lot of times we can do things and we, we have, we've been doing this long enough. As I said, I've been doing it in Ohio for 35 years uh, and uh, we know enough people and enough of the programs and the activities that go on a statewide basis to where at least we can direct them somewhere uh, that can help them. Uh, we did a lot of work back during the mortgage crisis on uh, uh, foreclosures, uh, and we're still working in that area. The big area now seems to be uh, uh, bed bugs. Uh, believe it or not, that is a huge, a huge problem, and uh, the, the the rules and the regulations are changing almost daily. And uh, so, luckily, so far since we started the program in October, we haven't had any calls from from uh, Athens regarding that, which is a good thing. But any issues or any housing-related uh, questions or so forth that you have or that your constituents have. We're more than happy to do what we can and to help them out. We do not want people having to call four or five numbers, so the idea of the program is to get them the help they need or tell them exactly what they can do. In terms of tenant-landlord issues, the tenant has to do the initiating. Nobody, you, The tenant has to take the ball and kind of run with it. Uh, the way the law is written. Uh, and we advocate, even though we're an advocacy agency or an advocacy group, and we do tend to lean on the side of uh, consumers, uh, you know, we do work a lot with landlords, and we let landlords know that we're not out there to get them, we're out there to help them. But on the other hand, you know, if you do something, especially in terms of fair housing, uh, we have an attorney. Uh, that's uh, in, uh, located in the northern part of the state that's a fair housing attorney that we work with a lot. There's not a lot of fair housing attorneys uh, in the state of Ohio, and so we use him a lot, and uh, he helps us out, and he uh, does it a lot of the stuff. We make agreements, and he does it pro bono, so that works out really well for us and for the people we work with. So. That's kind of in a nutshell what the program is and, and what we uh, like to do. Uh, we also uh, do, you know, at the end of the program year, annual uh, reports of, which we'll make available to the city and so forth and, 
and, and so on, but I will be more than happy to answer any questions or if anybody has any. Yes, ma'am. I have a comment because yes. I just, as you were talking, texted a, your number to somebody who contacted me this weekend about an issue. Okay, great. And I, great. this is perfect. So, great. Um, Excellent. Hopefully Excellent. they will we'll contact look, you. Yes. Well, hopefully they will. Hopefully yeah, they it's will. A, a, exactly what you just discussed. Okay, great. Yeah. Great. We'll look forward to it. I'll let my wife know. She does. <laughs> Um, Don, I have something, yes. um, and I think it might have been the failure of the city to make you aware, but we have added sexual orientation right. as a protected category. And I get that it's maybe not federally recognized, but I would like to have that included. We'll, in well, we, we did a quick run to get okay. information out uh, with the program, but I'll, we'll make sure because, as a matter of fact, it's funny, over the holidays, Linda and I were uh, in Arizona, and we were driving and we were talking and I said you know I think we messed up and she said what do you and I, she said I, I said Athens has sexual uh, orientation or sexual preference as a protected class and she goes oh my gosh I forgot so we will make sure that in the next run which will be coming up soon that we will make that change thank you and we'll make sure that that's in part of all the documents and so forth that we come up. thank you yes sir oh, go ahead. Oh. Um, Kind of to follow up um, with what was just asked, is military is military also included in there as a protected yes, class it's, at it's least in the city the, of Athens? It should be in the uh, in the on the uh, in the brochures. It might not be on on that. Uh, it is. It, okay, I wasn't sure if we had updated that, but yes, okay. military status uh, okay. is. We don't get a lot of those, but it, it's it's interesting. The reason that military status even got in there had nothing necessarily to do with the actual individuals who were serving it was their families mm -hmm. as soon as they would leave the landlord would evict them right and there yeah and so the state jumped up really quickly on that one and and uh so we were really happy with that that's a that's a good one and that's a state one it's not a federal right thank you yes sir um in the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned that you were going to be meeting with university officials. Mm -hmm. um, and what, how wide is the dissemination of uh, the information that you're giving us well, right this, now? Well, okay, this, uh, the stuff that we just, uh, um, that I just mailed today went to 15 different locations, mostly advocacy social service agencies and then we're meeting with uh and i'll be uh, uh, honestly i i uh, i cannot think of her name but she's with the uh off-campus housing barbara harrison yeah that's it and we're going to be meeting with her and so we'll take a whole bunch of uh brochures and stuff for them and and to help get distributed out through the campus and then we're going to do a mailing uh probably in early Mar uh, or late February, uh, early March, that will designate all of the various departments within uh, the university, whether they need the information or not, but just to try to hit as many spots as we have. And it's a, it's a process uh, that it takes a little while to get it geared up, but eventually you will see this information in grocery stores, laundry mats, uh, any place that allows a bulletin board or a slot to draw the library, any place, that, even if I can sneak in and drop it in, I'll, I do that. Because we go to, I, one of the trips that I'll be making uh, next week is I'm going to hit all the grocery stores and, and laundromats and stuff around to see if they have a bulletin board. And if they do, I'm going to be sticking up at least the posters. And if they have a place that I can do other things and, and uh, so forth. So we try to get it as comprehensive as we can. Okay, thank you. Here. Um, we also have a 211 system. I assume you're going to plug into that. Yes. So if they can't get to your, eight, if they don't know your 800 number, they can call right. up and say, where do I go for this? I yes, okay. we will. We will. Okay. As a matter of fact, we're kind of regenerating some of the old contacts we had when we did the program, you know, a number of years ago and, and uh, uh, reaching out that way, too. And you said most of your, um, you get a lot of fielding for rentals, I believe. You said student rentals or student? Well, you, we get a, most of the calls we get are going to be, uh, I'll, you know, we're not, I don't expect to get 
that many fair housing complaints, mm. but we will get the ones we will get will be from students, and they'll probably be international students. Mm. And that's where we usually, from past experience, it is, you know, that it's happened. Uh, I do, we probably, I would figure that, you know, um, six to seven a year on fair housing complaints. Mm, okay. And the rest of it will be uh, tenant landlord issue type program or questions and issues and so forth. And from Pat, like I said, from it'll probably break about half and half, half from students and half from non-students, okay. other residents. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Thank you, Mr. Eager. Thank you, I appreciate your time. And uh, now we have a presentation from our Athens Public Transit System. Again, introduce yourselves and... George, this is the fracking thing. Oh. They had extra yeah. Good evening, my name is Lance Rep. I'm the Athens Mobility Coordinator uh, with uh, Hawking Athens Perry Community Action. And uh, my, some of my additional duties is I supervise all the transit programs at HAPCAP also. Coordination of transportation services is very critical to a lot of different uh, agencies and our residents in the county. And that's the main focus of what I try to do as a mobility coordinator. ODOT has strongly recommended that we uh, form a network in our community that discusses coordination and collaboration and sharing of services uh, with all the different agencies that have transportation uh, or receiving federal or state funds. Um, as the budgets continue to shrink on all the agencies and the city and the county and everything else, it's, it's critical to us that we keep exploring these things. I think there's something like 63 different federally funded transportation programs in the state of Ohio. And they're all overlapping where they could be sharing services. Um, one of the things that we've tried to do in this county and the city is we have an Athens County Transportation Task Force and we also have a city transportation task force. Both of those meet regularly. Um, I'm pretty proud of the Athens City Transportation uh, Group, which I think the mayor and Paula and Charlene and Chris and Allahu are on that committee also. We've come up, and Chris and Michelle too. We're getting a lot of people. <laughs> but the, the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, we've been meeting for, what, four or five years, and the last two or three years, has really come together and we're starting to get a lot of things going on, a lot of uh, ideas brought to the table. You know, one of the things, people want to remain living in their house as long as they can. And one of the things that's, uh, and a lot of that is illness, uh, caregivers move away. And the other stat that's kind of uh, alarming is that all of us in this room, the current trend is, we will outlive our ability to drive a car by eight years. So as all of us continue to age, you know, there's a possibility there's an eight-year gap there where we can't drive. So we got to start looking ahead for things like that. Um, and everyone in this room will face a mobility issue at some point in their life, uh, whether it's a family member, a caregiver situation, uh, kids move away and there's no one here to help, uh, the cost of owning a vehicle and all that kind of stuff contributes, whether it's temporary or permanent. So um, three years ago at HAPCAP, uh, all we had in our transportation department was uh, we operated Logan Public Transit for the city of Logan. And then my program, the mobility, came along. And now we're also uh, over the GO bus um, we took over the administration of Athens Public Transit in uh, January, so we've been at that for a year. Uh, we had 298,000 riders in the city transit system this year. Uh, so that's quite a bit. There's 52,000 a GO bus, 
And um, as a result of our growth, we moved our offices from Gloucester down to Athens at uh, 1015 East State Street. We just opened up in uh, November, so if anybody's out on that end of town, we'd like for you to stop in. I'll take just a minute uh, before I turn it over to Michael Lockman, who's the, our Athens Transit uh, Manager. Uh, recently, we just opened Athens On Demand Transit. This is a grant-funded program that we got through the Developmental Disabilities Council of Ohio and the Osteopathic Heritage Foundation in Nelsonville. So we got the funding to start this. Uh, we have two vans right now. We have three new ones on order. Our goal is to provide transportation to persons with disabilities in Athens County. If we have space available, our next goal is to provide medical transportation to elderly uh, and people with disabilities because medical issues are, you know, very critical. We'd love to be able to go to Columbus because that's the next step on this is uh, solving that problem. Um, we operate uh, six days a week, Monday through Saturday, eight in the morning till nine at night. Uh, we require pre-registration, and basically all that is is you call in and we get all your, your data, where you live and all that stuff, and get it in our computer. You call in 24 hours in advance uh, and ask for a ride. If you know your medical appointment, you know, a month ahead of time, you know, we suggest for medical appointments that you call in to make sure we have the um, service. Uh, our number is 597-2404, and we've been at it about six weeks now, and we had 311 riders the first month. So with two vans, uh, that's about our approaching our limit, but I have the three more coming. So I just wanted to take a minute to say that, and now I'll turn it over to Michael, who's going to update you on Athens Transit. Thanks, Lance. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Lance. Well, as he said, I'm Michael Lockman. I'm the Transportation Services Manager for Athens Public Transit. And I've been at the job just over a year now. I started January 3rd of this past year. And prior to my taking that position, uh, a lot of the grants management had been done through the mayor's office by Charlene in the midst of all of her many other different duties. And I still, I don't know how you pulled that off for so long. I'm, I'm in awe. But it's, uh, it's kept me busy. Um, the first thing that, that happened when I walked into my office was that we had a major regulatory review from the state and they, they hit us with some surprise findings and so we spent a good part of the past year bringing ourselves into regulatory compliance. I think we're in a good place now but it was an interesting start to the job. Um, we've had a lot of staff turnover this year. Our longtime general manager in operations, Daryl Van Nest, retired this August. and. Uh, our former dispatcher and administrative assistant, Mary Daly, has been promoted to general manager, and she's done a great job of that so far. She and I work very closely. Um, we've also got a new mechanic. We've had some staff turnover in that position, and one driver retire and two new drivers hired. So, some changes. Um, a couple of things that I'm excited about right now, we just put in an order for a brand new vehicle. We had a year where we didn't get a new vehicle. We, we generally have a replacement schedule of one a year. Um, but because of uh, two being bought with ARA funding a number of years back, we had to skip a year. Uh, but for 2013, we've got a brand new one on order. It's got some new features, some new bells and whistles. And we're all very excited about it down at the garage. <laughs> and in addition to that, um, a couple other things that have happened. We've upgraded to from cell phones to two-way radios for communications. Uh, those are safer. They're mandated by the state. They don't like cell phone communications. So that's been a positive. And we've also just this past week put in a new 
vehicle exhaust ventilation system at the garage, which is an important step in terms of environmental health and safety. So hopefully our employees down there are going to be breathing a little less of things that are toxic to them. And that's definitely a plus. Um, on the communications and media end of things, about three to four months ago, I redesigned our website, which is at www.athenstransit.org. And if you go there, uh, we've got maps now that are zoomable. They're based on the, the Google Maps API. Uh, so you can mm -hmm. go down to a very fine level of detail of where the bus route runs. Um, we have a running news feed so we can do service updates. Um, just the other day, I was able to put out some information about Carriage Hill being closed for a short amount of time with the snow. We've not had the capacity to do that on our website in the past to get that sort of up to the minute service information out. So that's exciting. We've had about a 15% growth in ridership this past year. Um, that came as a bit of a surprise to me for as much um, groundwork as we've been laying. But there continues to be a very high demand in this area for bus service. And even more exciting, I'm, I'm happy to say that for this coming year, it looks like we're getting about a 50% increase in our level of state and federal funding, which in the current funding climate is a very big deal, <laughs> I have to say. Um, and again, not one that we'd, we'd necessarily expected. We'd hoped for it, but we really were waiting to see what ODOT would come back to us with. So that's a recap of 2012. We've got some big ideas for things that could happen in this coming year, in 2013. And I'm going to, to walk through those. Um, most of the changes that I'm describing, if they go forward, it would probably be sometime in late August to, to attempt to coincide with the start of the Ohio University semester. So to miss most of the construction of the Oxbow Bridge, <laughs> which is going to be kind of an issue for transit service in terms of routing. So the number one thing that we're working on is a rebranding of the system, a reimagining of its image. This is something that we've worked a little bit with uh, local designer Kevin Morgan on. He sent us some designs back and forth. But it's very much an open process at this point. If you have ideas of logo design, color scheme, name for the bus system or for individual services, please send them to us. Uh, you can send them to me. My email address is, is lockman at hapcap.org. Or uh, you can send them to Lance. Or if you see us out around town, you can flag us down and hand us a slip of paper, whatever you want to do. So going on from, from changing the image, we're also looking at changing some of the, the structure and the routing of the system. And these, these are bigger, more structural changes. And um, one of the first that we've talked about, that we've explored, is the idea of actually moving our main bus stop, which is currently located across from City Hall next to the parking garage, um, and taking that down to Mulberry Street next to Baker Student Center. Um, so this is the, the section of Mulberry that is behind Bentley Hall and Lindley Hall. Some of the ideas behind this, um, as we're looking to grow ridership and coordinate with other city area transportation services, we noticed that this is a natural meeting point for a very high pedestrian flow. So you've got pedestrians in the tens of thousands that are passing through that area right there. Um, the city owns a fairly wide right of way next to this particular sidewalk, so there's there's opportunity for infrastructure on city-owned land at that particular spot. Um, the, the, the sidewalks are ADA compliant, which is an important thing, particularly when you're working with um, vehicles with wheelchair lifts and wheelchair access. This is the big one. All of the other local bus services in Athens stop and pass through this particular point. So the OU CAT shuttle 
um, the private apartment complex shuttles that we have in town, and some of our airport shuttles and taxi cab services all congregate in that one particular spot. We have a bit of a problem right where we are on West Washington with connectivity with those other services. So there has been the issue raised of if this move was made, how it would work with the fact that bus passes are, cert are currently made here at the mayor's office in utilities billing and, and uh, elsewhere in the mayor's office. And the question has come up of how um, patrons with disabilities would navigate that if it was moved down. And that's really still an open question. I think it's going to be something that we're researching pretty intensively in the next month here to try to get some opinions from our current ridership, um, people that work with some of them. And so I, th I just want to raise that, that issue as, as something that's still in the air as part of this as we're exploring it. Also with bus shelters, we have a grant right now, $50,000, to put a number of bus shelters around the city. And this is something that I've been working on for a while with Paul Logue, city planner. And we're by no means to the end of the tunnel yet. There's still a lot of potential sites that are flying around. But it's exciting to at least have that money. And we're working on some technical specifications and site designs that might potentially be useful um, across all the different sites that are under consideration. So along with this idea of putting up bus shelters, there's the question of how to really make our routing the most efficient. Right now, um, if you look at our, our bus map, and I apologize, I don't have an image of it here, but what it tends to do is circle around town on a very circuitous path. Um, sometimes in the industry we refer to this as a milk run route. Um, we're trying to hit the most possible locations, but what you pay in terms of that is you have an extremely slow service and often a very difficult service for patrons to figure out. They don't understand how this route connects point A to point B necessarily. So one of the things that we're looking at is streamlining our routing. Um, with the idea being that Athens is very compact and walkable. That's one of our strengths as a town, I think. But we have certain spurs of the town that are not particularly walkable. Um, so what we've tried to do is take the idea of Richland Avenue, which is one spur, going through Court Street, which is our central business district, and out to the East State Street shopping district, which is a long spur that is particularly difficult to get to because of the highway being there that cuts off a lot of the access. And having that be the access that a lot of our bus routing is done on. So we would take two routes that are currently in use that cover parts of all of that, but not in a very direct way, and have them run directly Richland Court East State and have them overlap. Mm -hmm. So you'd be <coughs> covering with one route part of the far end of Richland Avenue and with the other route part of the far end of East State all the way out to Holzer Clinic is where we currently terminate. But within that zone of high activity, you'd actually have an overlap where you'd put the bus on a half an hour frequency rather than an hour frequency. And what that would do is allow you to double your, your frequency, the number <coughs> of buses in that high traffic zone without actually adding any miles or driver hours or cost to the system. Now, I say that, but what happens to the other areas that we cover in this very circuitous way right now? Do they lose access? So part of what we'd like to do with our increased federal and state funding is to add another small route, small vehicle, <coughs> uh, maybe even starting with a van, that covers the, the East Valley side of Athens. It would go through uh, the dormitory complexes, the apartment complexes on that East side, such as River Park Towers, Mill Street Village, and the Mill Street neighborhood and the Near East side of Athens. So that would be covering a lot of what's taken away from the current routing. But again, it would be much more direct 
and legible if you're, if you're looking at it and thinking about it than what we do now. Let's see. I have one final thing to throw out. Um, we have a, a third route in town, and this covers the west side of Athens and goes all the way out to the plains in a large loop. We go out Columbus Road and up Route 33 into the plains and then back via 682 and down Union Street. And the problem with this route right now is that we've run it on very limited hours. It only runs 10 to 4 weekdays right now. And one of our most common service requests is for expanded hours on that route. And so another thing that we'd like to try to do this year at some point is to take that routing and, and expand it by an hour or two on either end to bring it more into line with our in-town route schedule, which is 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, I don't know at this point if we'll have the funding to do all the way 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. on that Plains route, but even an hour on each end would really go a long way to opening up access for people on the Plains and the west side. So I know I've probably thrown a lot of ideas out here very quickly. Um, we're going to be hopefully presenting more detail on this to, to city government in the coming month. And if, if these ideas really gain steam, our hope is that in March or April, we'd like to do some public hearings to get a wider public process involved in discussing them and moving them forward. So stay tuned for that. We'll definitely be in touch with council through this whole process. And um, I guess I'd like to open the floor to questions. Council members? I do have a, a comment to add. Um, Charlene uh, has done a wonderful job in the past of coordinating the Athens Transit system. I think it's it was always well run, well coordinated. But it, it's you know Lance's mobility manager federal program, and now Michael coming on as a manager has really uh, made a huge difference in transportation in, within the city and within the county. So I'd like to thank you all. Uh, for being part of a team, and I think it does show a coordinated effort. Mm -hmm. Michael, uh, whether you, I'm not sure if you knew or not, but started coming to the Athens Transportation Advisory Committee meetings, what, easily mm, a, a year or two before you became the transit manager and had done some of your graduate level work on the, the mapping system of all the different route, routes of the different bus systems around the city. So he, um, has worked with it a number of years, uh, well beyond just the year you've been with us. So, um, I, I would be particularly interested. I know that when we had the Go Bus system and we were originally working with Cash, uh, that system has now um, e evolved to doing more online purchase of tickets. So they have a better idea of ridership. They can anticipate the needs when they need eight buses on a you know Thanksgiving weekend, which has happened. And I'm wondering if we would have the capacity of considering, you know, online purchase of Athens Transit bus passes and making them available still at City Hall for those who are used to coming into the city proper and, and know the parking system here and know that where they can get in. But then also kind of building on the online ease with which all the students uh, purchase things. Either. And, and just to respond to, to what Chris was saying earlier, first of all, I think that that's an excellent idea to explore. Second of all, I'd like to say that I'd really be in remiss if I didn't point out the tremendous job that the mayor's office, the mayor, and Paula in particular have done with, with helping us to bring all these coordination players together. Um, I know that Paula's done a ton of work with Ohio University on the Memorandum of Understanding, and there's a transportation component to that. Um, I've also had some contact personally with OU student government and various um, university administrators, and, and I think that there's, there's really a good feeling town gown in the air around this particular issue at the moment, and that's, that's very exciting. I would, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I would like to make a comment. It just feels, mm -hmm. you know, we always talk about the lack of public transportation, but hearing your, your comments tonight and what you guys have been able to accomplish, I mean, we're, we're moving ahead. I mean, I think, you know, we mm -hmm. have 
I don't, maybe this isn't the word state of the art, but we have a pretty nice system going on in our area, and that's, you know, due to a lot of your guys' efforts and all the work you put behind it. But there's a lot of thought here. That's pretty, pretty evident. Yeah. Well, it's thanks to a lot of people. So, do we have a time limit on when we have to buy those shelters? I seem to recall that there was. End Is of 2013. Okay, so we have plenty of time to do that for the route changes. The bus you're going to purchase, is that going to be a different size? Because we talk, I know we had that conversation about mm -hmm. how we have one size right now. If you want a more flexible fleet, do you be It's the same it? size. It is, okay. It's a, it's a different layout, though. We, we made the change of taking the wheelchair lift, mm -hmm. which has traditionally been at the rear of the bus, and the, real, the wheelchair positions at the rear. Um, we decided that there were two things about that that we didn't like. One was that for wheelchair passengers, it's an extremely bumpy ride because mm -hmm. you're back behind the rear wheels of the vehicle. Um, all the skew as you're going around turns, you get the most bounce. So we took that and we moved it up to the front of the vehicle. So you now have in this new vehicle the lift by the passenger door and the wheelchair positions just back of the driver. Um, so hopefully that's going to be a little comfortable for, more comfortable for everybody involved. Um, it also means that if we have high capacity, even though this is a small vehicle, mm -hmm. um, your biggest area for standing passengers is going to be in the front of the vehicle. So the natural flow of a bus is people sit in seats, and then as the bus fills up, if people have to, they stand. Well, with our old buses, if they were standing, they were standing at the back of the bus and then having to push past people. And if you've ever been on our buses, the aisle is not very wide. So the idea of this was also that if we have standing room only, it has a little bit of a more natural progression that people get on. If they're standing, they're the first to get off, and that eases the congestion for everybody else. Um, okay, and um, of course, bike racks will be part of the system as mm -hmm. well. And you're talking about the express uh, axes from Richland to East State, and with the neighborhood ones, doing circles around them. Would they overlap just at one point or uh, several points, I guess is the question. I could see where you get an express mm -hmm. bus that meets at Baker Center, but then they might, by timing, overlap somewhere in Home Street for right. the Erie side and the express. Is that a...? You're visualizing it very well. And yes, there is the possibility that they'll overlap at multiple points, okay. which makes connections between routes more easy. At the same time, it's... It's difficult, I can tell you from a, an operations and technical perspective, it's of just, getting all those time yeah. points to line up. I understand, okay. And I do hear a lot of requests for going to the planes uh, a great length of time. A lot of people want to be able to work and work later. And I think that's where the on-demand is actually filling some of that gap mm -hmm. as well, yeah. uh, from what I've been told. Yeah. So it's, it's good that it's working together. Now, you also, t we brought on Summit, I believe, right? You did that. That's right. correct. I, I didn't mention that, but uh, we are running the, the contract for the Summit at Coates Run Apartment Complex currently. So it, it ceased to be an exclusive system to a, a public system. Mm -hmm. Correct. More access as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. You had a question? I, yeah, I just have a comment, um, mm -hmm. and it's about the that mobility service for persons with disabilities, which mm -hmm. Um, on the uh, Commission on Disabilities, uh, we've been hearing through those circles that how wonderful a system that is and how appreciated that system is, and, and mm -hmm. that it's not that expensive either. I don't know if that was mentioned. Um, $2, two, one. two one way uh -huh. um, to where I think you have some addicted riders who uh, just love the service. Um, and it, it makes sense because it's anywhere within Athens, um, Athens County. Um, so like I said, it's, a, it's as simple as calling and, and reserving a spot on, on the van, and the van comes and picks them up. And if you have an appointment that takes uh, you know, a fair amount of time at a doctor's office, if schedule allows, uh, the van will actually sit there and wait for the individual and, uh, or go in, on a subsequent route and then come back and get them. So I, uh, from a uh, disability standpoint, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful system that this city has. Uh, it's invaluable. I agree that on-demand fulfills a huge need in this area. I have barely heard a thing negative about it. I think people are thrilled, and it's, it's really exciting. Sorry. Well, I just want to know, uh, how green is the fleet? How, sorry? Green. 
environmentally sensitive? Uh, environmentally fuel sensitive? Using? Yeah. Um, we're using a mix of diesel and gas. Um, we're not yet to the point where we've seriously researched any alternative fuels. Um, we'll have to see. That that may be a this project. It kind of seems like it'd be ideal, though, especially mm -hmm. for small vans and things. I, I can't see, think of a good reason why they couldn't be like a hybrid. Mm -hmm. So it seems like something be, should be looked at. Definitely. I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that there's always room for improvement because, uh, as Lance said, we'll all probably about have eight years of, of immobility where we won't be, well, somebody will take a driver's license and we'll have to get around otherwise. And that's what we have to plan for it so it works for everybody, regardless of whether they can drive or not or whether they can uh, walk down the street or not. Um, and, and again, we do put a certain amount of money into it because it just doesn't break even. So, um, you know, it's, it's a service that's required, I think, from my point of view. For, However, for a good I city. Think anybody in the city doesn't support that. Okay. I, I'm, I'm sure that we all do. Member Drosny? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Michael, for uh, your summary of all the efforts uh, that have been going on over the past year or two. Uh, longer, actually, I'm sure. Um, I think with with the people we have in uh, positions now to oversee and, and manage our transportation um, in Athens City and County, I think we're, we're coming a long way. So thank you for your work. Yeah, I think so too. I have a, um, a question. As I'm on the Good Works list serving. Maybe this isn't for you, but maybe for the city or for me personally, just to, to share this with others. Uh, the homeless shelter in Athens, one of their, they send out an email saying what they need. One of those things is often bus passes. Mm -hmm. And so personally, I think, um, I know that we're provided state and federal funding, so I'm not sure if, if we're allowed um, total flexibility and, and if we can allow certain riders to ride for free if they're homeless, for example. That's um, a good question. I, I, I'd, I I'd like to find answer, out. But yeah. um, I, I think that <laughs> that would be that. one thing we could do um, to help out a certain mm -hmm. part of our population that has the most trouble uh, getting from point A to point B. Yeah. And so uh, I'll, I'll look into it, and maybe if you find an answer, uh, let me know. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you. Right. Well, thank you all. Um, we're going to move on to our um, two committee um, <coughs> agendas. Uh, first is Planning and Development Committee. Um, <coughs> Member Fall, you're the leader of that. Thank you. On the first order of business today is a revocable license at 63 North Court Street that's been requested. Um, this is otherwise known as the former location of Blue Gator. I think most people probably recognize it as that and kind of get in people's mind. Um, we do uh, revocable licenses um, really quite a bit on planning development probably at least once once a month we have revocable licenses normally um, they are for things like fences or signs that are placed on city on the city right away um, this particular one is a tiny bit different um, it's for um, a revocable license for a balcony to go over it's kind of like an air license so there's no um, a, Impe impediment on the sidewalk itself it's for a balcony to go four feet approximately four feet over the sidewalk on North Court Street um, we have the um, applicants here tonight to answer any questions um, so if you'd like to come up and introduce yourself and maybe briefly describe your project and good evening uh, my name is Brian Wharton and uh, I apologize if I was supposed to have these to you earlier, but no, we have out. actually we have I think we I have, have drawings. I think yeah, I think I have a little bit more. You have yeah. colored drawings. Well, that's always yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> colored drawings. We liked are, colored. Pictures. We like colored pictures. Kill a tree. Thank you. Oh, these are multicolored. Thank you. Uh -huh. So, um, obviously, we are, uh, our group is asking for a revocable license 
It was brought to our attention as we were going through the uh, restoration of the building. We've um, taken a lot of uh, um, satisfaction, enjoyment of, of taking the, uh, the property that obviously sat vacant for uh, a number of years, three or four years. Um, we have a commercial tenant that will be moving in in July. Uh, it'll be a full-service restaurant, and they'll have a, uh, a bar there as well. Um, we have uh, five apartments upstairs. They um, uh, consist of two five-bedrooms, two four-bedrooms, and a two-bedroom. Um, and, uh, you know, we had, as all of you probably remember, there was the, the uh, big blue, um, I guess, hence the name Blue Gator, uh, that... Um, came off the building uh, 11 feet, and um, we had uh, always hoped to, uh, to bring the building um, back to what it, it looked like in the late 70s, and um, I think there's a picture, there is a picture there on page two of the handout. Um, that was taken from the, uh, a page out of the Zarni, Zarni plan, I'm, I'm told, and, uh, and the uh, picture on the top was, uh, as it appeared in 1978, and uh, the bottom picture there on that page is uh, how the building was um, suggested to be rehabbed if that, that date ever came. And uh, obviously we've added um, one, uh, another story to the building. Um, the top of the building um, had a facade that uh, we've taken three feet off of the uh, three or four feet off of the top of the building and um, added another story. The, the third story is set back uh, approximately 20 feet. I think it's like 19 feet. And so the height from the, uh, the front of the building has only changed six or seven feet from, from what it used to be eight or nine months ago. Um, so the, the balcony um, on the top picture was, was um, you know, how it used to be, and, and, and flipping back to the front, um, that's how we hoped it would appear when we're done with the project. It's uh, four feet in width. Uh, we were, uh, it was brought to our attention that um, a revocable license was needed to have, um, to have a balcony, I guess, over 18 inches, I'm told. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we think that it's, it's a, a nice uh, addition to historic uptown Athens. Um, uh, we hope to, uh, it, the picture um, has a green uh, railing there, but we uh, are, would like to um, have a black wrought iron uh, railing and have a Victorian look to, uh, to the building. Um, and then uh, I think I've included some pictures of some other balconies um, in the area, uh, and um, on the last page, as, as I know this will, is probably a subject that will come up, um, I have, we've done this with other places that we've, we've rented, um, we manage or, or uh, whatnot, uptown that have balconies. Um, we've added a lease addendum where we limit the number of uh, tenants that can be on the balcony on uh, certain weekends. Um, I think uh, here um, at the top here on uh, number two, and, and, and we haven't had the tenants that we have the building rented to sign this yet because I guess we didn't know we were going to have a balcony and we just kind of thought of it. Um, but this, was, this is our kind of standard thing. And uh, number two has where the damage of the common areas um, are, uh, unless someone's willing to own up to it, um, it's billed throughout the building when the common area can be locked. And this common area will have a intercom system in each apartment and, you know, their guests will ring at the, uh, at the entrance and then they can press the button it automatically unlatches it and, and locks again when it closes. So I guess what I'm getting to is it, it gives the tenants a sense of responsibility in the building to live responsible because they know that unless someone steps up and says, I did that or my guest did that, everybody's paying for it the same. Um, 
the third point there was the landlord will reserve the right to limit the number of people allowed on a sun porch. Um, we have, we've used this above the uh, Court Street Coffee, um, the old Barron's Men's Shop. Um, we use this at Denham there. We use it, we use it above uh, or at Brony's there on the sun deck. Um, and then uh, we have, uh, I, I thought, something that I would like to add for this particular property because um, unlike those two uh, instances where they're sort of set back and they're not actually balconies, um, no furniture allowed on this balcony at any time. Because I personally just think it, it looks kind of trashy. And um, so, um, you know, it's one thing to go outside and enjoy it or to be able to open. We have in the, on the front there, we have some French doors um, on and, you know, have, have them be able to open the doors and let the outside in or vice versa. Um, so I would, uh, you know, we'll, we'll certainly put that in our lease addendum where there's uh, no furniture allowed on there. And I work right across the street. Um, going by it probably 90% of the days a year, and so I'll make sure that happens. I'm also very confident that the uh, tenants that we have uh, leased the apartments to will be, and I'm sure everyone would always say that they expect their tenants to be, but I'm, I'm extremely confident that the tenants that we have now and in the future will behave accordingly. Um, lastly, uh, I think from... Um, A safety, uh, safety concerns from fire. I mean, I think that's what everybody always kind of is worried about. Um, we have the whole building fire suppressed, which it wasn't. It, it is now. Um, we use fire-rated drywall. Uh, the doors are fire-rated doors. The state fire marshal will have to put a stamp on, on the project before uh, we get a, a state occupancy permit. And um, specifically speaking on the balcony, um, you know, 18 inches, uh, there's two things. One's it's sort of aesthetically, I think, you know, if you have 18 inches, it just sort of looks like a gate up to nice doors. And if you have, you know, four feet, it's, it's, it's usable. I think we're um, fortunate to be in a community where we can use the second and third story of our buildings downtown, I think. I'm sure some of you are familiar with Pomeroy, and if you drive down Pomeroy, I mean, there's beautiful old buildings along the riverfront there, and the only um, floor that's being used is the main floor. Um, um, some, some cases like that at the uh, Nelsonville Square as well. Uh, but from a fire uh, safety standpoint, with a wider balcony, um, the uh, south, I guess that would be south, yes, the south end of this balcony um, is only it's less than 12 feet off the ground and if you have an 18 inch uh, balcony if you call it um, I think from a fire safety standpoint if you're if you're choosing to exit the building that way 18 inches can be a little constricting in trying to um, exit the front of the building and four feet certainly allows more movability and I know um, it's like 11 feet, 4 inches, and I know, you know, 11 feet, 4 inches, and this is worst case scenario, I mean, because the building is fire suppressed and everything, but I know 11 feet, 4 inches isn't going to keep me, you know, from jumping off the balcony, and certainly 4 feet gives you a lot more movability than 18 inches to do that. Um, so with that, uh, you know, in conclusion, we're just... Uh, we're happy that the project's coming to an end. We think it's a nice addition uptown. We uh, appreciate the support that the city's uh, given us so far in the project, and uh, specifically the Board of Zoning Appeals, allowing us to, uh, to uh, have a variance to, uh, on parking distance to, um, to do the project. And uh, I guess I'm asking for your continued support to uh, allow us to have four feet of balcony. And I guess any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Um, I, th I appreciate very much you coming in tonight. And I think um, I would also like to express my um, appreciation for your research into the historical uptown plans. 
Um, a lot of people don't do that. And I see all the other um, balconies. I think that the only time we recognized balconies was during homecoming when a gazillion people are <laughs> on them. Um, but I think that it's, it's very true that um, we have identified balconies as, some, as a design element that could be used to, um, for aesthetic appeal up, uptown. And that's been identified in other, um, um, some of our other planning documents. Um, I think that what I, I will try to forestall some of the require um, some of the concerns that may come to council members um, by stating I think that people will be concerned about noise, and we have heard that from other developments in that general area, um, and so I would suggest that maybe you look at some noise reduction design elements, um, meaning specifically maybe on the on the up. The north, the north end, a, a wall or a plant, a planter divide that would go up on the the end, so that when there's people on the balcony late into the evening, that there's some kind of noise. I mean, the Bronies has done when they put that the covering over the <coughs> outside area. That was a huge improvement. I think that, um, and I think that some of the um, pictures that you see on the other balconies, some of them are covered. I, I particularly like like this one with the little the little kind of train looking um, roof on it um, and then the one with the the you know office chair next to it I think that's yeah, a, a right. contrast of good and bad design um, personally I think that design makes a huge difference in how neighbors and every and people interact and I think that if if um, we get any concerns from people in, in the city and the neighborhoods, it's going to be about noise. And so what I would suggest is just to look at some noise reducing, mm -hmm. particularly maybe a trellis or a wall, and in um, putting in your um, lease, lease requirements, um, noting specifically that they know the time limits for the noise ordinance. Mm -hmm. And you can't put noise ordinance times enough in, in leases mm -hmm. you know we may have a lease agreement but if you make them look at it again and sign a special mm -hmm. then they know yeah and so I think that that it is an uptown area it's where the bars are but also that we need to be just mm -hmm. concerned about so. I, I can appreciate that um, the only thing I will say to that I, we have no issue uh, looking into something there um, but this is um, I think with the number of people that are, I mean, it's still four feet is, I mean, if, if you come and look from when you open the doors, I mean, it's like two steps out. And I mean, there's not going to be um, any number of people on that balcony that wouldn't be maybe just on the streets. Uh, I mean, I'm sure they'll be able to create more noise from the sidewalks than, right. than a, but I, I have no problem looking at as right. long as from a yes. aesthetic view like it's not like a permanent like concrete right. kind of right oh i would yeah. suggest i don't know what you know. those look like but definitely will i mean a lot of um i was looking at noise reduction for outdoor eating areas mm -hmm. um at one point a lot of them they say you know um vine covered trellises mm -hmm. yeah or, i mean i think that know, would look those, pretty, yeah. those sort of things mm -hmm. um especially during you know spring and and fall mm -hmm. those sort of things would work yeah. very well um i'm trying to to forestall some of the issues mm -hmm. that might come from mm -hmm. the neighbors because we have had these issues in the past oh, yeah. so mm -hmm. um, I think that that um, you have to we do have to recognize that sometimes there are a lot of people out on these balconies and sometimes it's a little scary I mean you say 50 people on your that is um, yeah. that, that that was um, for a different balcony. Oh yeah, okay. no, this was yeah. So because huge, that that's a lot of yeah, people. Yeah, no, that's that. So, that uh, I mean, there's a level of, of safety concern. Oh, absolutely. So. That's actually not a balcony. That's a, a sort of a roof. roof. Yeah, okay. and it and so. it's uh, funny enough, it's never right. used. Uh, I don't believe, but uh, yeah. is it some? Yeah, very little. Yeah, very little. Very yeah, it's it's weird. Um, but uh, yeah, the square footage on that's probably. Uh, 20 by yeah. 40, I bet you. But this, I mean, from a structural standpoint, this, uh, you know, all we did was uh, cut off the beams. Uh, well, we haven't cut off the beams yet. We cut off the concrete from what was 11 feet back to 4 feet in hopes to keep the 4 feet. And then we will uh, do the same with the beams. But those steel beams um, are 
almost 30 feet into the building. Um, so if it was able to hold the uh, engineer to hold, the, you know, right. um, we could probably have everybody shoulder to shoulder on there and it would be fine. But, um, yeah, but anyhow, um, I Are there guess. other questions from council? We'll go, we'll go down the line. How's that? All right. Um, I don't know how many people in here shopped at the old dime store in Athens, the Woolworth building that mm -hmm. sat empty for so many years. Um, thanks to the university investment, I, we're finally seeing that being used. Uh, the Burger King building that has been empty for many, many years is, is now, uh, looks like it's getting prepared to be yeah. a, a kitchen and a restaurant. So it's, it's really good to see yet another building that we've seen empty for quite some time mm -hmm. be invested in, and, and so I, I appreciate that. Um, I, I think it looks like a very tasteful design. As you point out with the pictures, there are many other porches of some design, some variety in the neighborhood. And so I don't think it's it's um, unique in the fact that it's a porch. Um, I, I support it. I think um, it, you're doing very good work with, with the building there. And I appreciate it. So I, I, I will support uh, council's action on this. Chris? Uh, just a, a question with a little bit of background as it came through planning commission is that it came to the planning commission after going through the board of zoning appeals and the board of zoning appeals my understanding is that the balcony was conceptually um, presented and then requested to be removed is that um, I think the board of zoning appeals um, I think there's some that 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 did come up but I think there's some question as to whether that was kind of their avenue on you know, as far as uh, what the balcony uh, should or should not be, um, and uh, but yeah, they did uh, want us to remove what was there. Uh, and I think from there, Brian came to meet with me, and I explained that this was indeed would have to go to city council because that's your right of way, and you get to determine the use and your right of way. Mm -hmm. And this is something that obviously isn't permanent. I mean, it's revocable. I know that I'm going to be held to, uh, and we are going to be held to a standard to make sure that this is, you know, uh, doesn't cause a problem. Um, you know, it's monitored accordingly. I mean, I'm confident uh, that the uh, the tenants and uh, myself will make sure that it's it's. Uh, there's no furniture out there. There's not. There's not gonna be a problem. And certainly, you know, um, with it um, going on to the city right away, we've uh, part of the application was to submit um, insurance um, should something happen there. And you know, we obviously have done that as well. So I, I too, really appreciate. The effort that she went into. I don't know how old this upper photo is, but I. 78. It's mid 70s yeah. or something yeah. like that. Um, and when I look at that particular image of the building, before it had the the uh, uh, blue gator, swindlefish, the whole list of places that are going back before my time now with the swindlefish. <laughs> right, where it was this building that was added on to the existing building and how you're bringing it back to what it once was. Uh, to me, it's also aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing um, and fits with the, the Zarni plan of, of what it should look like when you look around the city of Athens. Not just the city of Athens, you look around Athens County, you see a lot of towns and villages that have um, balconies like this, which fits with with the period, fits with the flavor of what is southeastern Ohio. Um, so therefore, I, I um, and and I appreciate the fact that you also understand that it is a revocable license if it goes through um, to where um, it could be revoked. Right. Um, um, and I'm glad to see that you've put some language and or in, or at least in the beginning stages of putting some language into your lease agreement to where. Um, it becomes clear. One one thing I would would uh, mention to you, you: you talk about a sun porch in here, and then you also talk about balconies. So I would I'm yeah, this you're was talking about the, the same thing, right? This was just our our sort of standard lease addendum, and we you know we change it for each property. Okay. <coughs> so just that it's clear in terms of yeah, what absolutely. you're telling someone, because they could yeah. flip things. Anyone could flip right. something no, around. Absolutely. 
Thank you. Uh, other than furniture, is what else might be put there or not? Well, I, I, ideally, I would like nothing on there. So I guess I'll uh, make that. Well, if we, if we go to, say, the trellis with. Uh, well, I mean, from the tenants. The yeah. Vines, but yeah, I'd suppose like someone has a potted plant or a tomato mm -hmm. or something. Are you right. going to say, uh, now um, you can grow your own organic tomato on, on the balcony? I think, uh, uh, I think in this fairness for everyone, I think I'd like to probably just keep it empty when it's not being uh, uh -huh. used uh, just from. See, a tomato plant's not furniture. So. No, I know. So, I mean, <laughs> yes. and you have a lot of good lawyers. That's right. And yes. Students who will find that <laughs> right. way to weasel around You're it. Right. I think I should probably put any any items that uh -huh. be more specific. That's yeah. a good point. Yeah. No automobiles. No. No anything. No tents. No tents. No tents. <laughs> and that's true because if you're not specific, they. Uh, they no, I, if you are yeah. specific. You've opened yourself up for some way to get around it. Just Good point. General ban. Good point. Yes. That's it. Yes. Stay back. Yeah. Michelle. So I'm I'm impressed again with mm -hmm. all the work you guys did with putting the effort into uh, showing the former, the historical aspects, and all of that. Um, the third ward is downtown, uptown. This is downtown from uptown. Yeah. Um, and. Um, I um, have no problem with this, as it as it sta as it stated. Paul, um, taking out of the revocable license review that was done by city staff, if you remove the conceptual comments from both uh, code and the city planner, I would request that at a minimum that you do indeed, um, if you issue this comply with the fire department who stated no more than 25 people and um, with the chief of police's um, statement about the lease restrictions concerning the access to them. Okay. Paula, can you clarify access? What did, what did you mean by? When um, you began this, I heard that you were, would limit certain weekends. I don't, I don't think I said certain weekends. Um, I, I said limit um, the number on certain weekends. Yeah, the number on certain weekends is in the uh, in the form here that uh, the lease addendum, um, and certainly um, we'll do that. But but you would have a maximum occupancy that they yeah, would have we'd, to we'd, all the time. Yeah, that and I have no problem with that. I mean, th what the only uh, folks that would have access to this balcony are two four bedroom apartments. So I mean, we're talking eight people, and and their guests so um, I don't anticipate it's not a common uh, sun porch or patio or, or whatever it is I mean it's just it's just two apartments eight eight tenants and uh, I, I really don't anticipate um, any problems whatsoever and certainly if there are problems then I will uh, knock on their door at 8 in the morning and make sure that there aren't any problems in the future or we'll just call you it you call and me for whatever you'd like. I'll, I'll be there. So I, we've all been in buildings where it says so many people in mm -hmm. a certain area. So right. I guess if the fire chief says no more than 25, have a you can make it 16. Today. You yeah. can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. um, no more than 25. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I wanted to mention. I wanted to mention that if you're talking about eight tenants mm -hmm. in two four-bedroom units up there that are the only ones who technically have access to that, you're talking about have them bringing, you know, 17 friends on there with them, uh, right? And I think, um, you know, if you open the door and you look, I mean, it, it's it's going to be hard to fit any more than 25 people in there anyhow. It really is. Um, I, I don't see the enjoyment, um, and maybe um, there is enjoyment, but I, it, I mean, you would literally you're also be like, sober. yeah, you're sober. You would, yeah. <laughs> Some, true, something else true. that might drive this and may have also driven where the um, fire chief has come up with that number is probably through the Ohio Revised Code. I'm sure that uh, Ohio Revised Code may speak to building requirements for um, square footage and uh, occupancy yeah. of square footage. I know it does for, for rooms. Mm -hmm. um, I would imagine there's probably yeah, a probably caveat right. in there dealing with balconies as well. And I have no problem putting in the uh, lease addendum uh, 25 people. I mean, frankly, this is more about aesthetics to me than than anything. Um, I just think it will look 
uh, more uh, like it should be there if it was actually big enough to be functional then um, you know 18 inches is, is so close to the building that I would hate to you know do all of the, that what we're doing and then it looked like you have a gate up to the to the door and so what about grills N nothing <laughs> definitely not grills but yeah I, I'm gonna I'm gonna tighten that uh, that was something I scribbled in there at the uh, very end when I was putting it in here today just to bring it in but yeah, that's organic to <laughs> And the height of the like railing is probably a little higher than you normally would. Uh, the height of the railing um, is whatever the. So uh, see. You're, you're dealing with the Ohio building. Now. Yeah, whatever the state of Ohio is going to. acceptable there. Yeah, I mean, I would imagine it's going to be, you know, every bit of, um, you know, three and a half feet or. What is so. it, Bart? 40, 40. Three and a half feet. Also no. I'm sorry. Something just popped in my head with the grills and all these other things. <laughs> does, does your will this unit or all these units allow pets as well? Or uh, no, we don't allow pets. Wander out on. Yeah. Okay. You don't want a cat Eagles. jump on? No chicken. no chicken. I'm sorry. <coughs> sorry. Okay. So if I'm understanding correctly, then the fire chief is recommending. A maximum number of mm -hmm. people. Be able to I thought that's why you, get I thought you right? had the revocable license. Yeah, review. So you got the revocable yeah. license. He says uh, one person for five square foot. I'm sure he's quoting code Can't there. See the back side. Steve. Um, maybe what we need is some kind of, um, you know, how they have sure. a requirement put on, you know, maybe in the entrances to the balcony something about yeah we can put it right by the door there yeah i mean because more the more warning people have the better because sometimes you have friends over who are for the weekend and they're house sitting and they just don't know so so and i'm confident that the tenants that we've signed these leases uh to are not going you know I, it's a brand new place we tried to um yeah. not have destructive Tenants, and I'm confident that uh, the tenants that we have are going to live right. uh, appropriately. And I think most of us are talking about big weekends. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Halloween. That's it's a hard weekend yeah. to be able Absolutely. to. <laughs> Paula's favorite weekend. Yeah. Um, to to control your friends. I mean, even mm -hmm. if you know who's over and stuff, you know, you're running around saying, "No, you can't yeah. do that." I, mean, I understand. Don't yeah. fall and, off the balcony. And don't fall off. And you can't lean over the balcony. It's don't not like the, the kissing stone in Ireland. So mm -hmm. I think that, that these are just kind of cautions that we would like to see on all the balconies. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one reason why OU changed the, the um, thing for the homecoming parade was mm -hmm. the balconies were really scary for a lot of people who were in the parade and besides just people on the streets. So, you know, I think that not being over, trying to be overly nanny or anything, just trying to cover all the, the bases. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, I if um, these certain things that have been brought up are written into the ordinance, I, I see bringing this up for first reading on Monday. Yeah, it sounds good. I just encourage Brian to maybe have a have a have a oh, farmer more, yeah. a mm -hmm. farmer addendum. Yeah. Just yeah. show us before we, yeah, vote. when yeah. we vote. I'll bring it back. So there will be three readings on this. Yep. So. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you, you for coming by. Have a good evening. Okay. Um, my um, second agenda item um, mm -hmm. for planning development is um, I would like to bring forth a uh, program element, a <laughs> ordinance to establish a program in Athens, the city of Athens, to establish um, monitoring, um, restitution and um, restoration monitoring program for the city based on fees that are derived from any um, drilling, operation, production of oil or gas wells, or disposal of waste or wastewaters from drilling or other hazardous products. products. Um, as you know, the city of Athens has been trying to do certain things to make sure that the health and safety for the citizens of Athens is protected through this um, 
the, the excitement of all this oil and drilling that is may come down to our area of the state. Um, what I see right now happening from the state level and um, definitely from um, the state government right now is that the city and the county is going to um, be at a loss if there is some kind of hazardous um, event, an oil spill, a gas spill, hazardous waste spilling, um, or leaking through the processes that are going on when you do oil and gas extraction or injection wells. Um, so what I see is happening, um, especially from what the, the state has indicated from the Kasich administration, is that they're not really interested in making sure that the communities that are um, responsible to their citizens for health and safety and the health of their water and of their air um, receive the resources in order to protect that health and of the water and air. And so the purpose of this um, monitoring fee would be to ensure that um, those resources are protected. Not only would this um, cover monitoring of water, and that includes baseline monitoring of all, not only our wellhead, but also of other well and um, surface waters within the city. Um, but it would also look at other impacts that the um, gas and oil industry um, processes may have on the city, such as increases in our li um, insurance liability, um, increases in road maintenance, um, the uh, training of our firefighters and other uh, responders, first responders for hazardous waste spills and accidents, um, any type of equipment that may be required for those uh, first responders and other people in the city, um, and um, air monitoring for air pollution standards within the city. Um, so what this basically does is establish a um, fee permit system within the city that would be um, the purpose of the fee permit, um, the fee that would be required from each individual gas um, extractor or um, injection well operator would be put into a special fund, not the general fund, but a special fund for monitoring restoration restoration and restitution, environmental restitution um, for the city. Um, and that would also have to require a different uh, ordinance to establish that fund. So this is the first step of a multi-step process. And I will, um, I know that, that we've been talking about certain things such as the severance tax and this is our, our next step of trying to um, cover our citizens so that our taxes and our water fees are not paid for, are not paying to cover um, monitoring that should be done by the industry or restitution that should be done by the industry or cleaning up or increases in taxes or increases in insurance that um, are kind of the result of this industrialization of um, this, the city. Um, I provide you with kind of an outline. It's not an ordinance form. Um, and part of this came from um, the city of Oregon in Ohio. Um, they were uh, a hazardous waste um, disposal facility was uh, cited within their jurisdiction. Hazardous waste disposal facilities are very much like permitting for oil and gas extraction. It's completely done um, very similar by the state. The state has all control over permitting, location, and all those sort of things. But they said, you know, there are going to be all these impacts on our, on our coffers. Um, so they said that we're going to ha put an impact fee, basically, on the hazardous waste that's being um, put in the facility. And um, the state took them to court and went through the Supreme Court. There is a Supreme Court um, 
case on this particular thing, and it was found that they were in their right to have a, a mitigation monitoring fee put on upon, upon them. So um, this is, is from a lot of their language that was put into their ordinance. And so um, I have presented some languages that can be put into an ordinance and um, open it up for discussion. I, I see this being discussed at least two times in, in committee. Questions? Um, is this, this will be effective then for only within the city limits? Yeah. So nothing beyond? Um, at this point, yes. Okay. You know, my hope is that it would be nice if the county did this too. You know, they, they do have certain jur jurisdictional opportunities to be able to do this. Um, and that would be even more powerful because they have, if you um, put in a monitoring program that can help um, private landowners do baseline water monitoring before, you know, drilling comes in, then they can be protected even more. And that's something right now if you want to do water monitoring and do a baseline of your water of your well it's costs you money it costs the landowner money who may not even be in, you know leasing their land their neighbor up the way may be leasing their lands that's a cost it's a cost and quite frankly i think that as it stands now people say it's going to be such an economic boom the city is not going to get a lot of economic um input from this we have an income tax unless a lot of people come into the city to live which I don't really see because our rents are already so high and housing so tight that they're not going to move into the city our sale we don't have a sales tax you know we're going to have all this impact without really a lot of economic input and right now with the severance tax even if it gets increased to not the second lowest in the United States, but maybe a little bit higher, Kasich wants to do um, an income tax reduction for that. So that wouldn't even go to the communities that are being impacted by oil and gas drilling. So. I have just a follow-up question. It has to do with the periodic review of the permit fee amount um, where you have December 31st of 2012. Is right. Well, this was. Okay. You know, so this is a, so it's a, not a retroactive a draft, thing we're no. working. And the okay. idea behind a um, Just periodic review is that there will be a cap. So if some company comes in and has four, um, four or five or whatever we decide upon um, sites, that there will be a cap on the number, the, the cost for them. Because each individual drilling site, there's kind of a, a, a um, when you get more drilling sites, the cost of monitoring doesn't go down, but some of the cost of training might go down for each site. So to, to make it um, legal and fair, then that's the periodic, the once a year review of costs. I think a, another point to add to all this is that in terms of monitoring, if we can think of our, our communities, City of Athens, ca uh, County of Athens, whatever we're looking at, as um, health districts. And apparently through Ohio Revised Code, through our public county health, city county health departments, they have health districts. And there's ways that language and, and ordinances can be crafted to deal with what we know are some of the impacts of uh, this type of uh, industrialized development. Um, in a rural area. So that's another area where we need to continue to look at is our health. If you can think of it in your, as your health district, um, that we may be able to also have additional ways to monitor and protect our citizens. And I think that's what all of us here on City Council, we're here to protect our citizens in, in, a, in a reasonable way, in a way that um, the be in the best way that we can. So this is, like uh, like Chris said, this is something that was done in the city of Oregon, and um, they were looking at a, you know, a very toxic kind of waste disposal site, and we know from all our research and history and what we've known, what we learn every day, is that we're talking about health and safety issues. 
There are some additional things going on. If anybody's following what's happening in Kent, Ohio, they're also looking at um, uh, issues related to uh, toxic substances coming actually through their city proper. We may look at some additional issues related to that. Uh, banning that type of whatever the substance is coming through our city. Kind of like Columbus does. They say, no, you have to go around the city. You know, there's different ways that you can manage hazardous waste. You know, I need to read through this more thoroughly. I like this document a lot. Um, and one of the things that I would like to at least mention, I you know we're early in this process, but one of the things I would really like to see would be to see our neighboring cities and towns um, north up and down the Hawking Valley because everything runs south and mm -hmm. our water goes from township under township by township and ultimately comes here and then we, we go further on south right. to everyone else and to have other cities on board with this plan or plan similar to this I think that would create the health district um, that's being mentioned right well I'm hoping that that you know cities all over Athens are um, Athens cities <laughs> the cities all over Ohio um, are are dealing with this limitations that the the state has given in very um, creative ways and you know Cleveland's doing something Mansfield's doing something Cincinnati and so this will add to the tool of toolbox and if we can find ways to I think ultimately what it comes down to is the protection of the the health and safety of the citizens and make it so that um, that the industry that is gaining so much profit I mean it's it's once again privatizing profit and making public all the costs and this is just putting saying hey you're doing a lot of business you need to make sure that you're covering the, ha the, the hazards of the business and to ensure that if something happens I mean we all know about the little orphaned you know sites that are all over the, all the orphan um, sites for drilling and mining around here and we don't want that and we don't want to rely on the state because the state has been unreliable and there can continue being unreliable from every indication of what they want to do with an increased severance tax I have the state will not help the the, the entities the municipalities the counties that are dealing with the actual drilling they're going to pass all the, you know, severance tax all over the state so people get, you know, $35 off in income tax, but it's not going to help us. It's just going to make it more costly for us. So, any other? Yeah. Uh, yeah thank you for putting uh, your effort into this. Um, as you say, the, the state regulations are often inadequate, and I think in this case they've been uh, very far off the mark of where they need to be. We know that they're often influenced by the industries that they're supposed to regulate and monitor, if not uh, written by people that are in or have been in these industries. And so it's, it's the fox watching the hen house uh, in many ways, and I think that mm -hmm. that's no way for our community to protect itself. So I see this as a very powerful way that we can have some local control uh, over uh, what happens in our community to protect the health and uh, welfare of our city so thank you and I look forward to seeing a, a few of the, the holes filled in here in a more mm -hmm. final version other concerns I just that the mayor and I were discussing whether or not this is an opportunity to put in where permitted for example we've already taken the legislative action mm -hmm. for outside the wellhead protection and the zones was another uh, right. discussion but, so. yeah I have to work on the legislative language my friend here and um, and also work with the auditor to look at because there are ORC requirements for these types of fees to be very closely related to the cost That's of programs means, yeah. and however I see that that this doing um, intensive water monitoring not only for the city I know that we do some wellhead water but this would expand it I mean this and also allow for maybe application for private individuals to to have water and surface monitoring so that may be requiring you know a half-time employee but that would be 
funded. This would the uh, the whole idea that this would be um, cost neutral ultimately to the city. So. Just a point about the cost of the programs, and um, it makes sense that whatever funds would come into this would be used solely for, mm -hmm. for that purpose in the city. Many people might not know this, um, but I've been told that were the if the water supply for the city of Athens were contaminated and we couldn't use it anymore, our next closest supply would be piping water in from the Ohio River. And, and how expensive is so that? So there, <laughs> there are, are very high costs um, associated with right. uh, potential catastrophic um, pollution or catastrophic spills that, that would have such a huge impact on mm -hmm. the city. Um, other questions? Um, so I, I see this as the first step in um, a, a, a bit of a conversation. Um, I will look at, at the um, comments that we've gotten this evening and I will, I'm getting together with Kathy and with Pat Lang to, to look at this. I think that this is, uh, I, I would love to have this as a model for a lot of other areas and to, I know so many places have struggled with the fact that this, the state has really tied our hands. And so, um, so I, I will go forward with uh, continuing to refine this. Now that I've heard from council. So, Thank you. Mm -hmm. I do have a missile. Oh, I oh, have a chip. Just the whole thing. I have chip. Chip, chip plan. Chippies. Please. Um, CHIP is our Community Housing Improvement Program, and I bet there's a grant due on March 1st. Is that right? April 5th. April 5th. Okay. <laughs> Plenty of time. <laughs> Plenty of time. We don't, okay. Not really. Great. Okay. Thank you. My name is Greg Andrews. I'm the Director of Housing and Community Development with Hockey Adams, a very community action agency. And we're here to talk a little bit about the CHIP program, Community Housing Improvement Program. The application process is open. The city is eligible to apply this year. Um, probably the most prominent change uh, from previous programs. We have a city has a uh, current program open right now in the last few months or so of that program and that program is funded at five hundred thousand dollars but um, with the anticipation loss of revenue that cap has been uh, reduced to four hundred thousand. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the, the the intent of the CHIP program. It's the, the primary purpose of the CHIP program is to preserve existing housing stock in the in the community. Um, there are a variety of activities available uh, that the city can apply for, but there's a, uh, a pretty extensive planning process that's in place. Uh, it's mandated through the Department of, uh, of Office of Community Development, and. Um, Based on the recommendation of that planning process or the participants in that process, um, we will bring uh, uh, together um, recommendations to the city uh, for the activities that, uh, that you can apply for. Um, it, you have the option to, to not uh, follow the recommendations of that committee, but you would want to have a pretty good uh, you know, reasons not to do that. Um, you want me to go over the activities? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. They're primary and secondary activities. The current CHIP has, right now, the current CHIP program, um, there are, we did um, private owner rehabilitation. We did eight of those. We're in the process, I'm sorry, three of those. Um, we did a uh, um, uh, rental rehab activity. And in, in the city, we participated with the uh, local metropolitan housing authority. Um, and that's, that's an option to, to partner with, with nonprofits. And there were uh, 13 um, um, home, repair, home repair, um, slots available. And in fact, I will point out that there's still a few home repair slots available. So we'll be, we'll be doing a little more active marketing for those slots. But the home repair activity is for one or two uh, repairs, um, income eligibility course for, for homeowners. Um, income eligibility is required. For one person, it's in the neighborhood of $30,000. I think a family of four is the mid $40,000 range. Um, the, the private uh, owner home repair program is uh, about $36,000 cap, and the, the a variety of, active, of, of repairs can be made through that, that activity. Um, let me find the, uh, the activities that are available. The ones that I had mentioned, of course, private owner rehab, rental rehab, uh, 
homeowners uh, activity and that's something that has been recommended previously from previous planning uh, groups um, we've, we've I think the city's kind of steered away from that just because of the economic uh, conditions but you know if it's recommended again this year maybe something that you want to uh, consider but um, it would, it's just that to assist a, a, a client to purchase a home and then offer rehabilitation services um, the Athens market I think is of course a little a little different than, than most but I do think we could make it make it work um, if it's recommended um, home repair new home construction we've typically partnered with habitat and new home construction uh, as you're aware and that's uh, uh, not only a good thing it helps meet the match requirement uh, there's about a sixty thousand dollar match requirement for a maximum grant and so the, their participation is uh, is important if we can do that um, there is a homelessness prevention although this it, it, this and a tenant-based rental assistance those are both activities but I think that we try to uh, to promote the uh, the, uh, the intent of this program and that's to preserve ex uh, existing housing stock as opposed to um, homeless prevention because the department or the uh, um, the state has programs in place to deal with those and and the, the resources for uh, um, to preserve housing saw are pretty limited so um, there's some secondary activities or supportive activities that go hand in hand with the primary activities and I won't I won't go into those necessarily um, that's it uh, Paula do you have any questions or comments or counsel Mayor? members have questions Last, it's a, usually an 18-month grant cycle. We've gone through, as you say, 500,000. We got this last rollover on it. Um, the, the, the problems, of course, was uh, home assistant, home ownership assistant, which is down payment. Of course, is the the poverty requires low to moderate income versus the housing prices in the city versus the mortgage payment rates that you can find. Um, we usually put one or two of those in the mix just in case. Uh, I think we've had we've had success with that. We have. Uh, the rental and rehabilitation with Metropolitan Housing was pretty successful because they, as an organization, it out, allowed them to go back and re-up their stock uh, at that point. Um, again, homeowner repair and re rehabilitation uh, are the two main ones that work, but that's a limit that how much you can put into that. Uh, really what uh, council has to do is authorize us to put an application in again. And uh, I think there's a series of public hearings that have to put in place, if my memory is correct. Mm -hmm. um, and again, this is to improve our housing stock and our, our, our you know, home ownership in general. I think that covers everything I could think of right now. Just one, one important point is that um, the, the, uh, the projects are awarded based on previous performance. So there's a variety of, of scoring in a, in a scoring tool, but uh, the performance in the previous program so if you don't if you if you know if you if you lay out some some outcomes and you don't meet those outcomes it's very detrimental to uh, to future applications so that's right. why that's that's critical to right. so marketing is important sure so but the ability absolutely. is actually to fill all those uh, right. desires that you all the plans that you put in place um, right. historically I think many years ago the, the city did did a blanket shotgun approach to everything and their performance was poor and therefore we didn't get this from it this wasn't even a, in a window of real application many years ago but it was before I think uh, Rick Abel's time uh, before mine certainly but I, I'm aware of the fact that you have to be you know we have to be realistic on what your goals can be done what can be met mm -hmm. uh, and I think we've done a good job so far on this uh, but this is a second we didn't apply for the previous cycle but the cycle before then so we've been trying to catch almost every other cycle, but it'd, okay. it'd be nice to be able to mm -hmm. march it forward another time. So I, I expect bringing this up for first reading on Monday also, and then we'll schedule the public hearing for another Monday in the committee meeting. Okay. And since it's not until April, we won't have to probably suspend or anything. Mm. It'll be close. It'll be close. <laughs> Maybe emergency <laughs> clause. <laughs> emergency <laughs> clause. Just in case. Okay. Oh, great. Hey. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. I have um, one miscellaneous um, several weeks ago we brought um, historic uh, um, ordinance about historic preservation and establishing a commission um, with that uh, Paul Logue I was just excited okay. <laughs> Paul Logue um, 
brought and gave us a presentation. Um, it's been in Pat Lang's office. He has been looking at sections of it. He will give us some um, updates and rewrites for that, and I expect that to be done by Monday, so I will bring that forward for the first reading on Monday also. And what were you ex so excited about? The just a historic this coming to you. Yeah. Yeah. Historic preservation. So it will be. It will excited be. About it. Okay. Something that will new. be. Oh. So, um, Pat's, Pat, Pat has it on his up, upcoming list. So, Excellent. that should be done, um, presented by Monday. So, and that's all I have for miscellaneous. Do you guys have anything? Um, just to let you guys know, there will be a series of public hearings. I think you got one of these. I sent it in an email to you. Right. Uh, this has to do with the feasibility of our uh, materials recovery system facility. Uh, there's going to be two meetings, one in, Ho in Hocking County in Logan, January 30th. That's what, two days from now, I guess. Uh, and the other one's February 4th, which would be a Monday where we are. So uh, that will be at the community center. And again, it's to, to for a... Uh, right. Uh, a review. I think it's just before they'll formally draft a, a, a report. Could you put those on the website, please? We can do that. Thank you. No problem. Um, normally, committee meetings are not for public. Um, that's when council. So, um, if you'd like to be put on the agenda, contact Debbie, and she will help you. So, not to cut you off, but that's the the how we were, run things here. So, um, any any miscellaneous from council members? Okay, my committee is now ended. Oh, okay. Um, moving along to the finance and personnel <coughs> committee, uh, member Nisley. Thank you, President. Mr. President. We have three items tonight, mm -hmm. and they have to do with prior year bills and some staffing, and then the third item is appropriations. Uh, for prior year bills, we've been notified that um, for the property that the city now has at 83 Columbus Road, um, and this is where we were removing the tanks, um, we did, uh, when they were removing the tanks, um, encountered some soils, some additional soils that needed to be uh, removed. And these were um, mainly along the trenches uh, that contained the supply lines. Because of that reason, the additional um, soils removed, we needed to purchase uh, additional uh, dirt to fill in the trenches. And the amount of that is $18,000. Uh, so uh, that's what's what we've encountered. Um, and if we have any uh, uh, additional questions, um, they got we received the bill from Chemron. Um, and uh, this is what's owed. Uh, we do expect a final report um, uh, from our public works director uh, reported that we uh, should be getting a report from Chemron this week, and that should allow for the uh, final buster closure on this property. So this is the, what we see as the worst that they didn't find anything else, and that's just... Well, we're waiting this. for that final report. Um, the preliminary data did not reflect anything that would be above the um, right. acceptable so levels, but... and the um, supply lines, okay. And it may very well be that the auditor will want some sort of retroactive... Um, she's not available this evening, so, so we don't know. Oh, as well as appropriating them, we might need to mm -hmm. authorize, so we'll check with the auditor this week. About and, it, and it's a... So last year, Bill had to make it on the flies in terms of that decision is let's remove this properly and send it to the landfill and pay for that cost. But we do have a bill that's owed, so. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Next item is staffing, and there's a request from the city to remove a part-time landscaper and place instead then uh, two seasonal maintenance workers under lands and buildings. I actually uh, was an error. It was never to remove the part-time landscaper. It was to bring back the two seasonal maintenance staff positions that had been in the staffing ordinance and essentially inadvertently were removed when we did the new staffing ordinance for 2013. So they're seasonal. They can only work up to 120 days. And their goal will be to um, do a greater job with the landscaping around the city and the beautification efforts. So. So it's only then the two seasonal maintenance. Correct. 
workers under lands and Apologize buildings. For okay, that. thank you for the clarification. Okay. Under appropriations, we have two items. And one of these would be um, a message that we received from the deputy auditor about funding for our internal services. And these are services that are provided uh, maintenance for vehicles for the city and also for computer equipment. And what happens is that the di different departments within the city uh, are, in effect, build or share a portion of the costs. So what we need to do is increase the appropriations from uh, other funds for support of the department budget by approximately $60,000. And this would be for the different departments' maintenance of the vehicles and the uh, percentage or the amount charged uh, to that department then is based on the number of cars uh, for the particular, uh, for the maintenance for those. And then uh, for the portion of the technical salary, it's based on the number of computers that they have. So the different funds that will be charged would be the uh, general fund, and then also our, the street fund, the recreation center, the community center, the water fund, and the garbage <coughs> fund. So these are the different departments that use these services, and we need to, to bill them appropriately. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm sorry, you said 60000 for vehicle maintenance, or that's vehicle maintenance and computer? And computer. Okay. And computer equipment. This is to increase the amount of money going into the Internal uh, Services Fund by 60000 We had a, um, we'd like to make an inquiry, and um, we can check with the auditor's office later this week, about having those be an additional appropriation instead of taking out their standing operating funds that they're using now. Particularly EPW is feeling the sting. Okay. So, so we're actually going to um, undertake an, our own internal audit to try to get the actual computer inventory and the vehicle inventory and see if it's being just dis distributed correctly in terms of because it's just a different world. We have a lot more computers now sure. than we probably even have vehicles. So. so you'll be in communication then with the auditor's mm -hmm. office about this. So that's the second item, this appropriation, and then also uh, our previous one that we just discussed, whether we'll need authorization for the additional, um, the prior year's bill. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, if you look, you I believe you've got the inappropriate fund balance earlier. And if you were to compare it to the... the funds that they want to uh, take money out of, it might be easy just to increase the, their funds and just move it in there rather than pull money. Right now, they're looking at their budget. All the departments have been looking at their budget say, we have this much, and all of a sudden, the streets, for instance, will say, wow, I'm down 20000 now. And, uh, you know, okay, that, that, so just you know. to, and so it's a way of looking at it, bookkeeping-wise, it would actually increase the appropriation then. Okay. Of each fund. Of and, each and just fund. dump it into internal services. And, okay. and again, we'll figure out which one works best. We'll okay. shoot it off of the So we'll have the, the, the update on that, on what's the preferred way, the suggested way to do that. And, okay. okay. I have a question on that. Sure. Last year in our staffing ordinance, we increased the IT department um, from what was one and a half full-time to two full-time positions. And it was not known whether it would be filled or not at that time um, or whether you would need that extra um, to move that half-time position to a full-time position. I'm wondering if that's happened or if you anticipate that happening and increasing the costs even more later this year. I do not know. The um, evaluation or the assessment that we're having for IT systems is still ongoing. Okay. Um, we actually were paying for one and three quarter time persons um, last year, and I, I do not know. But that's that's kind of why one of the questions I think that came from Andy's world was, you know, I, I would like to see how this is distributed mm -hmm. per department and per division. And, and he said it may very well be that he's supposed to support 56 percent based on, you know, the, what he has in terms of vehicle fleet plants and all the telemetry and what have you. But. But uh, I guess the final answer is no, we have not hired a second full-time IT person at this okay. time. And is, is there any specific um, cause of the $60,000 increase, or is it just a budgeting? Uh, uh, that's a good question. I don't know. It, I got the same email uh, earlier today, yeah. so I don't know okay. the actual give and take of it. I mean, it first came out that there was also a discussion about the appropriating 160000 out of the capital fund, and then all turned, out, it turned around and said no. That's okay. Um, if I look at the the total budget that's been in our uh, system right now, 
the appropriation for all the internal service support is about 337,000. If I look at my the ordinance uh, 012512, the entire amount for internal revenue was 441. So I'm not sure where mm. there's a big difference there, and I'm not sure if that's because they I put the appropriation and they decide they need the funds and the reserves. The uh, certified resources aren't there, or where how it's coming about. So that's what I need to find out as okay. well. But I'm just giving you a heads up that they obviously think something needs to be adjusted. Okay. Thank you. And if you look at the, as I say, the inappropriate balance uh, sheet that you just got uh, today that has uh, in the internal service is only about 11,000 in re certified resources. So there's obviously something needs to be, you know. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, put together. <laughs> we're, and we're just, I'm just going to say, this is the information I got early today from Ray. So those are good questions, and we'll hopefully we'll, we will have some more background information yes. by the yep. time we introduce the. I uh, certainly hope so. The ordinance next week. Thank okay. you. Oh, you have a question over here. Yes. Well, this is just for, for my own edification. Um, the, the way it's broken out by department is the say for te technology. Uh, one department has ten computers, another department has twenty computers. So the department with twenty computers gets billed more than the one with ten. So yes. Sort of. And it doesn't depend on what kind of computers ten or one department has or the other one. Um, no, it doesn't. Actually, I, I'm not even sure. It may even include peripherals like printers and drivers. I, I've yet. To, we we look at this every couple of years, and it's 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 a you know things change all the time. Right. You know, people buy thinking. computers, buy extra ones, get rid of old ones. Right. Um, so therefore, I, that's where Andy Stone's coming in, questioning and say, "Are you sure these numbers are?" Because as I say, the you look at the. You look at the internal support for the streets department, and it runs about 30% of this entire internal service support. Um, and he's saying, is, are you sure about that? Now, he has lots of vehicles, but, you know, that's so does the police department, so does the right. police department. Um, so I don't know how it gets broken down. I know one time we actually discussed, I think for other administration, we were actually doing a number of transactions going through our offices in the general fund in terms of whether it's... Uh, the auditors or the mayor's office of court, and uh, we were we were starting to look at that in terms of internal services, but that doesn't give us a realistic picture either. Mm -hmm. So again, when you start saying what kind of computers, the maintenance of them, well, we have maintenance contracts with some things, uh, leases on others. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just wondering about what, what say with computers is if, like with my computer, when it breaks, it's kind of dead. Okay, <laughs> uh, I, I get a new one, so there's not a whole lot of maintenance going on there. Well, the maintenance we're talking about is any IT maintenance as well. I mean, whether it's it, part of the thing there is it, we're talking about mechanics on, mm -hmm. on, the, on the car side, but we're also talking when somebody calls up and says, I clicked on the wrong thing and I've got a virus in my system, or, or I've, you know, what do I do next? I understand. So the, right. the, we, the IT people can spend so a lot of time. So it's also software issues, mm -hmm. uh, system upkeep, um, networking. Um, mm -hmm. My IP packet has blown a fuse and I don't know what to do at this point call call the guy so uh, and I would be I would probably say this also probably Roosevelt Tower comes out of this right oh yes yeah, so our phones and our, our, our IT our, our phone system as well that we have so you can actually add a number of phones to that system as well right the computers yeah. and the police cars I mean we could go on yeah. and on. laptops <laughs> notepads <Sure>. cameras <laughs> can't never mind okay <laughs> take care of it <laughs> so, and again, this is why we wanted to bring a consultant because this has snowballed over time. Exactly. And we've kept the, the same IT personnel levels about the same. We've been upping it a little bit with the three quarter time, but uh, what I've seen in all departments, and you probably see it as well, it starts out with 50 computers and an IT person, and you know, you blink, and you know, two years later, it's 150 computers. Yes, and, I know. And all the toys. Right. So, and, and everybody assumes that this person still will be able to do it all. So mm -hmm. that's why we brought in a consultant to look at this. But again, this is, I don't know where the numbers have, have, have uh, gotten in disarray here, except it sounds like we need more. And I thought I put enough in, but obviously I did not uh, yeah. have that conversation. With I just Ray. wish there was some way to better track what is really happening to what computer so that there would be a better way to, to bill that person or that department. But... Well, are, are you talking about the breakage, or are you talking about the scrambling of it? I, I mean, think he's talking about an iWork system kind of thing that we've talked about. Oh, you okay. You're talking about following the, the tracking the person's work. 
essentially. Well, uh, okay. In well, order to assign well, that cost of those hours or what have you. So. Mm -hmm. um, that is pretty, that is not monitored as well as we'd like. I see. Okay. But we, we do have a consultant on board now who's looking at the entire system, may, hopefully to answer these questions like um, Member Reisner is asking. Mm -hmm. Soon. Soon. Yes. <laughs> yes. And we'll look Soon. forward to that update, too. Uh, last item is just an update, really, tonight uh, about the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, this is our large um, uh, upgrade to the system, uh, the first in, in many years. And as background information, you might uh, remember that last year we passed an ordinance that um, authorized the design and engineering of the project. And then later, or actually earlier in the year, we had authorized uh, water rate increases. We're doing a, uh, what's probably a fairly modest compared to some of the other cities in Ohio. It's, been, it's a 3% increase each year over a period of five years. And we'll be evaluating that and looking at it in terms of our other costs to make sure that that is reasonable. But the next things that happen it, um, will be that over the next three months, we'll have a series of um, probably three things that will be moving through council to make the water treatment improvements possible. So we've had that engineering um, design phase last year. And then um, we will have the bid that will be opened tomorrow, or the bids. Um, and then uh, decisions uh, made on that. And then the next ordinance that we'll be having come through, it's, well, it'll actually be a resolution of tentative award of the person that's awarded the contract. And so that will be uh, one resolution coming through. The next one will be an authorization and appropriation. Um, and we'll be discussing this more at our committee meeting on February 11th. And uh, one of the parts of this project that we're working through is that we will also be part of what's called a water resource restoration sponsor program. And uh, we will enter into a, hopefully enter into a sponsorship agreement. And if I understand this correctly, um, what's identified are different areas in the state of Ohio uh, that are scheduled for improvements, uh, reclamation of lands, things like that. And by partnering with them, we can actually get a credit, I believe, on our uh, on our loan. It's a lower uh, interest rate. So it'll be a, it's in the form of a lower interest rate. Thank you, Paula. So that will be one item that we uh, work towards: is that um, water resource restoration sponsorship agreement. And um, then we'll actually need to work through the loans. And the financing agency that that will be coming through um, is the Department of Environmental Finance Administration, DEFA. These all have acronyms that I'll try and uh, read out each time just so we, we begin to know them uh, a little bit better. And then the actual funding agency that I believe that we're going to be working with is the WPCLF, and is that Water Pollution, Pollution Control. Control Loan Fund. And they are the ones that offer us um, a better interest rate than the Ohio Water Development Authority that we have worked with previously for our other improvements. So there's more paperwork at the front end, but bigger savings for us long terms in terms of a lower interest rate. So those are the uh, different agreements with different agencies that we'll be working through um, in the next, uh, really in the, just in the next few months to get this started on its way. Additional information? No, just that, that resolution, we will be asking for you to um, pass it Monday if, you know, after the bids have been in order to keep with this time frame, in order to keep our loan in the right queue. Right, because we, we have approximately two months to move all this legislation forward. Um, so it is a quick turnaround. So thank you for letting us know that we'll need to have a one, or suspend it, I guess. It is a one reading resolution. OK, thank you. And if there aren't any oh, miscellaneous items. Um, yes. Sometime around January 10th, I see you got an email from Claudia, the human resource director. We're putting out another survey. We're, every few years, we put out a survey for wage scales with other cities. Um, I guess she, she sent you an, an email, uh, finance committee in particular. I shouldn't say everybody, but um, with the idea is if there are any type of conditions or things you want to ask in that pay scale review or survey. Uh, we put it out to several uh, cities, usually about 10 or 11 cities. 
Uh, I think the last list in 2004 was 14 cities, of which one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight replied. We did get a, uh, I think, Mary's View uh, pay scale about two years ago. They did a survey, which we participated in. They gave us the information as a result. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason why I mention it, because I think she was asking if any of the council members or finance personnel in particular wanted to actually have any type of um, information that you would like to target. Uh, the idea is to stay within the statute city range. Uh, of course, the same size would be nice. Uh, so uh, if you also have suggestions on it, I'll have her forward that information again if you wish. I think she just put out a general a uh, request, and then I think a subsequent one, which she just sent to us to, was a, a spreadsheet of the previous questions and previous participants. Okay. So Thank you for that reminder. We'll take a look at that. Okay. Share that with Share I, I can shoot members. it to the rest yeah. of the council if needed. That would be, be. helpful. Uh, just, and again, part of the thing is that, you know, it's nice to do these things, but if, if there's something else we're looking particular that we need to add, and, and we don't want to make it too long, because the longer you make it, as you know, with surveys, the less response you get. But if we, if we have something that you think is pertinent or important that we should be quizzing them on in terms of pay scale and, and uh, levels of salaries, et cetera. And that's all I really have. I think we're finished okay. with finance. That's it. Okay. Any other miscellaneous council members? No? Mm -hmm. Then we are done at 9.05.